Hello, welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name's Heather and I make videos about politics. They're from the left. They are usually about UK politics, usually about the Labour Party, usually about the shameless weaponisation of anti-Semitism against the left. This one is about the Labour Party, but it's it's kind of local and national. So um, it's about Hackney and what's going on here, where we had a person who was elected to the council while they were under investigation and later prosecuted for paedophilia, for possession of a huge number of images of, of child abuse. And this councillor, although he resigned fairly quickly after he was elected, forcing a by-election, was um, very close friends with the mayor of Hackney. Um, they shared a home together. They had worked together. They were political allies. And it turns out that the mayor lied about how he handled this case, how he handled his relationship with this, um, this councillor. Um, so I should give names because it'll get confusing. So um, the councillor, the yeah, former councillor who was prosecuted is um, Tom Dewey. The mayor of Hackney is Philip Glanville or Phil Glanville. And I want to talk about this because even though it's something, well, partly because it's something that I know a lot about because I was in a local Labour Party for many years, from 2015 until I was expelled last year with um, Tom Dewey, with Philip Glanville, with many people in the clique around them on the right of the local Labour Party. Um, I got to know them, unfortunately, um, and how they operate. And so I think I have something to say that perhaps journalists who haven't been so involved can't say. Um, in addition, this has massive implications, in my view, beyond the um, immediate case um, of, of the kind of lack of confidence locally in, in Philip Glanville as mayor and the fact that he's almost certainly going to be forced to resign very soon. It kind of shows up a lot about the way the Labour right operate and it's being used as cover to um, to have a kind of coup, I guess. It is a coup of um, the, in Hackney North, which is one of the local Labour parties. I'm in Hackney South. That's where Tom Dewey and Phil, Philip Glanville are members, or were members. Um, and Hackney North is the neighbouring um, constituency where Diane Abbott is MP, and she's currently suspended from the Labour Party, and they're trying to get rid of her. So it's being used to make that easier. So, which is pretty disgusting, really. It's all pretty disgusting. So what I'm going to do in this video is it's going to be in four parts. So if you're familiar with the case, you might want to skip ahead and look at other parts, um, which look more at the implications than the what has happened. But for people who haven't been following this case, haven't known about it, I want to go into some of the details of what happened when. Um, also, I'm going to put some links in the description box below this video to articles where it's been covered in the press. Really good coverage by the Morning Star particularly, who broke the key aspects of this story when other newspapers, both national and locally, our local papers like the Hackney Citizen, didn't seem interested in really delving into it. Hopefully they do seem to be doing that much more now. Um, so you can kind of check up on stuff, find out more and so on. So let's get started. The first section is going to be what happened. I'm going to give a kind of fairly tight account of just what the details are. So what happened was on 15th of August of this year is that Tom Dewey was um, sentenced. He's a former Labour councillor and he admitted charges of making five category A indecent images of children. That's the most um, severe category of indecent images. Um, there are also categories B and C where he also had larger numbers of, of images that he had made. Um, what making means in this context is not the, the common sense use of the term. It's a legal term, which I looked up which means opening, accessing, downloading and storing online content. 
So in addition to the making charges that he admitted, he also admitted to possessing 78 extreme pornographic images portraying acts likely to re result in serious injury to a person's private parts and 1,523 prohibited images of a child such as cartoons or CGI images. I'm reading from a newspaper report there. Um, it's slightly awkward languages. Um, what it really means is that he possessed a huge number of images that involved children in, and that were sadistic. It's really shocking. Um, I think anyone would be shocked by this. I think if you knew Tom, also you'd be shocked by this. We never really know what's going on in people's heads, but when we've, certainly when I found out about this, it surprised and shocked me. I, it was disturbing. Um, okay. His sentence um, was a suspended sentence and he was ordered to carry out 150 hours of unpaid work. Now, for a lot of people, that's a really low sentence, particularly compared to the high sentences get people get for what seem like lesser crimes. Um, if you are interested, it's pretty easy to appeal a sentence. The more appeals they get, the more likely they are to look at it and to change it. Um, you only have, unfortunately, until 5 p.m. on Tuesday to do this, but I will put a link and basic information about this in the description below the video if you wish to. Um, I know, yeah, I know a lot of people who are disturbed by the, the light, what they say is a light sentence. Um, there is no evidence that Tom Dewey did anything more than harmful than is involved in these images, that he went, that he actually um, committed crimes with children. There's no evidence of that. Um, I understand why people might be suspicious that he did, given um, both the number of images involved and the time it had been going on. So these images date back, I think, um, well, a long time, something over 10 years. Um, so for basically through his adult life, because Tom's only 36, um, and throughout his adult life, post-university, he has had this practice, for sure, of, of looking at numbers of images of children. Now, this is really hard to talk about. I'm sorry, I'm just, I haven't had as much time to, to think through this video, and, and I haven't really talked about the crimes before that much because a lot of us have been focused, focused on the political implications and this video will be focused on the political implications but it is important to keep in mind the, the crimes and why people might think that there are other crimes involved and why people have very, very serious concerns around safeguarding in relation to Tom um, and in relation to the actions of the council um, leadership and the La Labour Party leadership locally. Okay, so going on from that, it's important to say that there's a kind of history of this in Hackney, which is also heightening people's concerns about the idea of a cover-up. Um, and that was that there really was a cover-up in the 1980s. Um, so I'm quoting from an independent article on this. Um, Hackney Council knew of four complaints of sexual abuse against Mark Trotter. He was a social worker employed by the council. Um, and that was by the late 80s, they knew of these. But they failed to suspend him because of his powerful position as a trade unionist. So again, it's these cliques and networks that protect people um, and that make people not see things um, and ignore things they should be seeing. And we see this obviously across the sector in relation to not just the abuse of children, but in relation to um, rape, sexual violence, bullying, um, and so on. Okay, so let's talk about why this matters. Let's talk about the mayor's lies and the cover-up locally. Um, so, I need to do a timeline for this. Tom's arrest was on the 29th of April, 2022. So that's more than a year ago now. The local elections were on the 5th of May, 2022. So about a week later. 
the National Crime Agency informed the council quite late on the 13th of May. So that is just over a week after the council elections at which Tom Dewey was elected to serve as a local councillor. The council informed the mayor the next day on the 14th of May, that's a Saturday. Um, and very shortly afterwards, they spoke to Tom and Tom resigned. And he also resigned from the Labour Party. I suspect he was suspended first. I don't know the DL of what happened there, but he certainly disappeared very quickly. Um, uh, someone who'd been incredibly involved in the Labour Party was nowhere to be seen and no one was talking about why. Um, no one was willing to have conversations about it on the right at all. Um, people who might have known, who'd been friends with Tom, for example, and close to him. Um, including Philip Glanville, the mayor. So, remembering that there was um, a home that Philip Glanville and Tom Jerry shared together. They were very close. They'd been on a holiday together. They'd worked together. All of that stuff, right? And they were allies on the right of the party, and the right is a, the organised right, the factional right, is a clique in Hackney um, that's existed for a very long time. There's always a certain cliqueiness to, to factions. I would say that in Hackney South, it was more than other parties that I know, in the sense that it didn't, it was very, very closed when we first encountered it, very difficult to, to get anything to shift um, in a way that. In Hackney North, it was also difficult to get things to shift, but they weren't cliquey in quite the same way. It wasn't just a small group of people just running the party and not even having meetings, for example. Um, okay, so carrying on. Um, Philip Glanville's original story about what happened was, I was not made aware of the police investigation until after the May 2022 elections, when I was told by the council, so on the 14th of May. Phil continues, I have not seen or spoken to Mr Dewey since I became aware of the investigation. He also talked about how he was angry, shocked and appalled at finding out about the crimes. And he specified I was not at the property during the NCA, that's the National Crime Agency action, and there had been no signs of that action at that property when I returned. Neither Tom Dewey nor the NCA alerted me. Okay, and he stuck to that story obstinately and he refused in meetings within the Labour Party and in council meetings to even respond to uh, questions around safeguarding. Um, so something happened, which is that a photo emerged and was, as I say, the Morning Star has been exemplary in, in promoting and um, telling the truth about this story um, and they put this photo on their front page which was a photo of um, I'll put this on the video so you can see it which is a photo of a small Eurovision party which was held in Phil and Tom's home on the night of the 14th of May so after Phil has admitted he was informed about Tom being arrested after he said that he had no further contact with Tom so what did the mayor say? And this I find really shocking. I was told of his arrest, but not the full extent of the charges in a brief discussion with the council chief executive the same day. Okay, a couple of things about that. That council chief executives also resigned. Might be just a coincidence, but it all just looks super suspicious, doesn't it? That's how, that's how things often happen these patterns sometimes they are genuinely coincidences thrown in to the authentic um, conspiring that happens um, but I was not informed of the full extent of his crimes that could mean anything it could mean I didn't know how many category C images there were it could mean I didn't know how long he'd been doing this for he doesn't say he didn't know that he was guilty of possessing images of child abuse. I think it would be highly unlikely that he wasn't told that. Um, and if he wasn't told that, he would have said. So this is just, this is not a lie, but this is a deception. And this is what we have to kind of realise with these characters in the low party, is that they move fluidly between truths, lies, 
and obfuscations and deceptions. Okay. So Phil Glanville carries on. I shouldn't have been at the event in which we were photographed. That's another one, isn't it? Obfuscation at which we were photographed, at which I took a photo of us. That's clearly a selfie. Phil Glanville does a lot of selfies. He's a lot of canvassing. You have to get good at the selfie. He's tall, so he would often get the per be the person to hold the camera when you're out canvassing to take a photo of, of all, the whole group. So, you know, this is a fine art and he's doing it again and we can recognise that. Okay, so why did he go to this party then? Apparently, he feared to cancel the event or not attend himself. Uh, may alert, this is quoting him, may alert Tom to what I knew during what I understood to be a live criminal case. He carries on, this does not alter the fact that I had no involvement in the case and shouldn't deter from um, other actions he took afterwards, which include, he says, moving out of the house the following day. This is so bizarre. Like, you think it's all right. You're not going to alert Tom to the investigation by moving out next day. But just like saying, oh, I just feel terrible. I don't want to go to the party. I'm just going to sleep. That, that would have done it. Moving out, that's nothing. It's, it's completely nonsense. Um, it's also nonsense because Tom knew he was under investigation, right? So what are you alerting Tom to? What are you worried about alerting Tom to? If you were worried, why didn't you take advice? Okay, suppose you're panicking for your political career at this point. You're like, oh my God, I've been living with a paedophile. I have ambitions to be a mayor for longer or to be an MP or I don't know what Phil's ambitions are or to work in City Hall, whatever it is, and this is going to screw them up. Maybe you're panicking. Maybe you are. I mean, like I was and other people were like also genuinely shocked about knowing someone who has, has done things that you never imagined they had done and that are really, really disturbing. Um, and maybe you don't act in the best way. But how do you explain the lie? And he doesn't need to see a reason to explain the lie. Like, why not say, when you're asked about it, you know, I was told on the 14th, and then there was this party at night, I wouldn't know what to do. So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go to this party, deal with it, like, and then just cut relationships the next day, just move out. But I didn't want to um, have those conversations with Tom. I was scared about having them. So I just avoided it until I could move out. That's not good. I mean, that's shit, but it's honest. If that, is that what happened? That's honest. It's relatable because like, I guess we're all human. We all make mistakes. We all have to apologize for them and deal with them and be accountable for them, especially if we're in a kind of elected position like this, where you have safeguarding responsibilities, where you have responsibilities to people who've elected you and, and responsibilities within the local party and all of that. And he didn't say that, and he hasn't seen any reason, as far as I know, to apologise for lying, even. He said it was an error of judgement. Yeah, obviously it was an error of judgement. Um, I think the reason he hasn't seen a need to apologise for lying is because he would be apologising to people for whom he has disdain, which is the electorate of Hackney. I don't think a lot of Labour councillors in Hackney really like people locally. I think they see us as, as a problem, almost as their opposition rather than their allies. Um, and they have a sense of arrogance in relationship to us. They see themselves entitled to tell lies if it's for the good of the world. And they see themselves remaining in positions of power as for the good of the world. So I think that's why it has been as it is and why he was able in his own mind to tell such a ridiculous story that's so obviously um incredible um in the sense in the actual sense of incredible as as not believable okay carrying on what do i think happened so what i think happened is that um tom told phil about the raid on their home and about his arrest and about what it was for. And that Phil 
then worked with other people to make a decision about what to do. And those people, I don't know who was included, but my suspicion is that included two of the people in this photo. So um, Samuel Emma, who is the, um, she's a Hackney councillor. She's the London Assembly member for this area. She is the um, mayoral advisor on the private rented sector. I mean, I really hope she gets replaced as a result of this because she's done a terrible job in that role in my view. That's another story. Um, also, I think James Peters was involved. He's in this photo. Um, James and Sam recently got married. Um, the guests at that wedding included Phil Glanville, included the local MP Meg Hillier, included the other councillor for De Beauvoir, Polly Billington, who maybe also was told. Um, she was um, obviously having to campaign with Tom um, so have an account with Tom and celebrate their victory together and then afterwards to tell people that he'd resigned for personal reasons and to campaign in the by-election. Um, I mean, I don't, I would think she would have been told this stuff, um, particularly given the mayor officially, even he admits he knew by the point of the by-election. She's now got um, a position to stand to be a Labour Party MP. Um, all these people, they're all kind of getting, they're all falling upwards, aren't they? Um, so yeah, I mean, James Peters did, stood, has stood down from the council at the time this photo was taken, but at the time when Tom was arrested, if that was, as I'm hypothesising, something which was known to Phil, he would have been told because he was the Labour Group whip. So he was in charge of discipline within the councillors in Hackney Labour Group. Um, we can only speculate as who else knew, like whether Meg Hillier, the local MP knew, I don't know. But she was also a close faction ally of Tom's. Um, she chose him to be her agent at the most recent general election in 2019. It's shocking to me that no, nobody has approached Meg and asked her what she knew and when about Tom. This should be a basic thing to do. So I think they got together and decided that the only way to hold on to that seat and perhaps not risk other seats in Hackney going to the Greens, who are, they're not the biggest opposition party, but they're the main opposition in most areas to Labour. Um, the Conservatives hold uh, five council seats because they hold seats in the Haredi Jewish areas, but across the rest of the, most of the rest of the borough, um, the main opposition is the Greens. And they were certainly challenging for seats and they went from zero to two last time. And they certainly would have taken this seat um, and others possibly if, if um, this had become public knowledge to any extent, I think. Um, and so they decided the best way to hold on to the seat was for Tom to stand for election. And I think that has obviously made the situation for Tom much worse because now his crimes are national news. They're on the BBC, they're front page news in, in the Morning Star, they're in the Evening Standard, um, they're over and over again in the, in the local press and so on. And if he hadn't been elected, I don't think that would have happened don't think that would have been news. Um, in addition to that, in Tom's case, one of the reasons he was given a light sentence was because he introduced mitigating factors, one of which was that he sought help very quickly after his arrest and that he was open about it and started honest conversations within the Labour Party. Now, if we believe Phil's story, he didn't do that. The Labour Party only found out through the National Crime Agency informing the council. Um, I'm more inclined to believe Tom than Phil for two reasons. One is I think Phil has more motivation to lie at this point than Tom did. Um, I, I also think Phil's story is implausible. But the main second reason is that I have heard Phil lie lots of times and obfuscate the truth lots of times. Um, I, I was trying to think about all the times I've been in meetings with Tom. I've heard Tom speak at meetings. 
I've had emails from him. I couldn't think of a time when he'd lied. He's been toxic, he's been difficult, he's been abusive, he's been just out of order in lots and lots of ways um, towards lots of people. Um, but I don't think I've heard him lie. And that's quite remarkable, actually. So, yeah, I'm inclined to believe Tom on that and to believe that he, partly because of his loyalty to the Labour Party, which I think is extraordinary, even as I think it's he's loyal to a Labour Party that I don't recognise, a very right-wing Labour Party. Um, I think he would have said, what do you think I should do in these circumstances? What do you think we should do? And there were a lot of choices for Labour, but there was a better route. So they couldn't have withdrawn Tom as candidate, it was too late. They couldn't have had a new, another candidate, it was too late. But they could have put out a public statement saying whatever they were allowed to say, um, even if they didn't talk about the case, they could have said there are reasons why we have withdrawn support from um, Tom Dewey. We do not want you to vote for him anymore. Um, we want you to vote for Polly Billington. We will release further details as soon as we're able to. He has been suspended from the Labour Party. And they could have stopped campaigning in De Beauvoir, not had him at the count. At a basic level, I think that would have been reasonable. I think as a result, the Greens would have won that seat. I think the Greens and other opposition, there were independent opposition to the Labour Party, also candidates standing largely on an anti LTN, local traffic neighbourhoods platform, um, who would have made a lot of it and perhaps they panicked about a threat to the vote in other places and that's why they did what they did and said okay we'll have a by-election after. This is all hypothesis by me. But doesn't it sound way more likely than the stories we're getting from Phil Glanville and others? So I want to say that this is very typical of the Labour right, the behaviour of the Labour right. Um, I've talked about this completely in detail breakdown in another video, um, so I'm not going to like go into detail, but I will share some stories from these people and from what I know. So as I said, James Peters in that photo was chief whip at the time of Tom Dewey's arrest, so would almost certainly have been part of any discussions about him standing if there had been any. And what's important to say about him is that, I mean, he did all sorts, including covering up um, or trying to cover up a case of um, data protection um, breach by our MPs campaign for reselection, um, which was just, just ridiculous. Um, it's just like they protect their own, right? They don't care. Things which are blatantly dodgy, against the law, criminal, they just protect their own. Um, and they really attack people who are not their own. And this is what he did. Just weeks before, he had been one of the leaders of an orchestrated campaign. I'm quoting here from Skippy O on Twitter. If you're on Twitter and you're on the Labour left or the left, or just interested in that sort of stuff, you should definitely follow Skippy O. Um, so it's an orchestrated campaign to remove a socialist council candidate in Hackney. She was smeared as an anti-Semite for protesting the murder of Palestinian children and for criticising the council. So yes, um, there was a campaign, a successful campaign, to get someone removed as a council candidate for saying that our council should divest from Israel's illegal occupation of Palestine. And one of the things she said was about um, Israel killing Palestinian children in Gaza with bombs that in part are funded by our council. Or at least, you know, the shares go to the companies, etc, etc. And this was called blood libel. Blood libel is the story that, uh, the anti-Semitic story that um, Jews kill Christian children for their blood. Um, this has nothing to do with Israeli war crimes. And trying to do that is shameful. Um, so his wife, Sam Wema, um, she is on the record now um, as saying, I only became aware of the rest and its nature when it was reported in the media in June 2023. 
like everyone knew about the arrest. It was on Twitter. I, I you know, everyone in the local Labour Party and actually anyone involved in politics locally in Hackney knew that there'd been a arrest, a raid on um, Tom and Phil's home. That was a pretty solid. It was never like really elevated above the level of rumour, but no one ever denied it. It was solidly known. People who were close um, confirmed it um, to various people. So I don't think that was ever in dispute. The idea that Sam didn't know that I think is ridiculous. Whether she knew what it was for, could she have not known that? Well, I knew what it was for. I'd been told that through two different sources. I didn't, again, I didn't know it for certain. I didn't know it enough to speak about it publicly. Um, but I, I spoke about it privately. I said, I think this is the reason I've been told it this way and this way, and it seems pretty credible. Someone so close to Phil, who knew for so long, so close to Tom, not to know, I don't find that believable. Um, if you're in that position where a good friend of yours, a really close friend of yours, you've been on holiday with them, known them for years, um, has to resign from the council only a week and a bit after being elected, um, and then it's for personal reasons, and you don't call them up and say, Tom, are you doing okay? What's the problem? Can I help? You would just do that, right? Um, and then what did Tom say? Did he lie to her about that? Did he say, I can't talk to you about it? I just don't want to talk to you ever again. Did she not wonder about what had happened? I mean, she's a gossip, Sam. I mean, we're all gossips, right? But she would have wanted to know. She would have asked questions, I'm sure. Um, so no, I don't believe that. And, and Sam, I've had lie to me lots of times. A lot of times these lies are really trivial lies. It's, the first one I remember was in the first non-conversation I had with, with Sam. Um, so it was summer, early summer 2016, and we just had the leadership election announced um, between um, Jeremy Corbyn and, oh, what's his name? Owen, Owen Smith. And um, yeah, it's good to forget his name, right? Because he is just a nothing. Um, so she said to me that she didn't really like the way in nominations meetings, everyone had already made their mind up about who to vote for, like Jeremy or Owen, and she hadn't made her mind up yet, which was clearly crap, but whatever. Um, she later in the conversation kind of gave herself away. I don't know, somewhat later, she was talking about how busy she was, how she was involved in so much in the Labour Party. Um, and one of the things she said was, you know, I just got an email from Owen Smith's campaign asking me to phone bank and I haven't decided if I have time to do that. It's like, why are you phone banking for Owen Smith or thinking about it if you haven't decided to support him? Like, do you realise these things are contradicting each other? Or are you going to phone bank for both of them? It was, it was ridiculous. It was a lot of stuff like that. She would tell lies just for her own convenience or just, I don't know. So I don't really trust Sam. Um, in addition, she would like hide stuff. So it was a long time when she wouldn't tell the exec even who was running the Hackney South Labour Party Twitter account. She was running it. There was nothing controversial on the account. It was mostly just canvassing photos, um, but she wouldn't tell us who it was for ages and ages. It was insane. Um, and then once I became secretary and there was like, she was voted out of the exec, it took me ages to get a Twitter password off her. I would like message her and she would just like ignore it. And in the end I had to get people to like, actually go on Twitter and call her out for it and say, why haven't you handed over the password? For her to do it and she did it straight away then um so it was just her behavior is just i mean it's a lot of the labor right do that i mean tom actually did something similar with access to paypal which was much more serious um so there was like this hackney label website which we couldn't use it was kind of the council's website but prior to that when the, the labor parties had been so on the same factions of council so on the right when that leadership had been like that they been a kind of agreement that we could use those those web that website that Hackney Labour website and after of course it became left we weren't but then one of the councillors agreed to organise she volunteered bless her um, to organise an event for the Labour Party um, a seventies disco it was and she because Tom saw her as okay and on on his side he set up an event for her on the Hackney Labour website and he used the PayPal account to collect the money 
for people who were coming to that event. And that was, that gave me a lot of anxiety. I was really panicked because none of us had access to that PayPal account. And when I asked Tom for access, he didn't give it me. And so that meant that our treasurer and our deputy treasurer didn't have access to an account with money actively coming into it. And I thought, you know, all those legal responsibilities that you have as treasurer, I, I, I had a very sleepless night. Um, I got loads of people to call Tom out on it in twi on Twitter because that was the only mechanism I felt that would work, and it did. And when he did, he didn't say sorry. He kind of told me off. He, I can't remember exactly what he said was, but it was like, be careful about what you do in public kind of thing. Um, well, you know, Tom, if you'd just given me it, it would have helped, wouldn't it? But they, they were all like that, the right. They were all, they just resented us. They just deeply resented us. Um, and the, the level of resentment is clear in another thing Tom did, which is he brought a motion um, to the local Labour Party that he wanted us to debate. Well, he called for the local party to actively condemn, he used the word condemn, members who seek to influence uh, planning decisions. Like, if you're a campaigner on housing and development, you seek to influence planning decisions. That is a democratic thing you're allowed to do. I mean, fucking developers try to influence planning decisions enough. And uh, also the kind of, I don't know, these consultancies, like the one that, that Tom worked for, they seek to influence planning decisions. Maybe we should have condemned him. Um, but no, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about campaigners like me and other people locally who try to, you know, address the influx of private housing that no one can afford into this borough and the loss of services and facilities to provide that useless private housing that people do need and do find useful, whether it's supermarkets or garages or community centres or whatever. So that's what he was talking about. Obviously, we couldn't hear that motion, but the viciousness, of it, the viciousness of it is really telling, right? He wants the local party to condemn people. Okay. So finish off on Meg Hillier. I've talked about um, Meg Hillier before. I've um, talked about a lie that we caught her in, in in a video, the video I did about the Labour rights. So I won't talk about that. She is the local MP. She is, yeah, I found her very difficult to work with. Um, I guess, okay, what, what do I want to say about Meg? Um, okay, as I said, Meg was a very close ally of Tom's. I think journalists should be pushing to find out what Meg knew. Meg is chair of the Public Accounts Committee. She is all about, in her role, she is all about accountability. She is all about holding people to account. She should expect that to be done to her and expected of her. Um, as I said, there was an abuse of data protection in the in her campaign for reselection. Also in that came campaign for reselection, she is not allowed to get involved in the organisation of the meetings to decide whether or not we want to reselect or we want to have an open selection. Um, she has to stay right out of it. And she was getting right involved. And this is how I found out. I don't know how widespread this was, but there was one. So the way you organize these meetings is you have to have observers at the meetings and they have to be from the executive. So it's quite a small group of people. And those members of the executive also have to go to their own meet, be able to go to their own meetings. So even if you're organizing like two meetings in the same night in different times and stuff, it becomes very difficult. Um, you can't have them all on the same night. And that was annoying to some people because meetings are usually, our branches usually all meet on the first Thursday of the month and most people wanted to have their their selection, reselection trigger ballot meetings um, then as well. But some of them couldn't. And one of the ones which couldn't was this one in a branch called Haggerston and we'd agreed that with the secretary and then the chair had agreed and the secretary had organised a venue. It was always very difficult venues in Hackney um, because you have to get bigger venues than normal for these, these meetings because 
more people are going to show up and you don't know how many people are going to show up. Uh, potentially you could have a hundred people. Um, and yeah, so the secretary had found somewhere and the chair then started to say, I think we should have a meeting on the Thursday. We can't have it on this other night. And this was just impossible. Um, but she kept like raising different objections. She kept saying, but I wasn't consulted, this, this, this. This conversation went on for ages across WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. And I don't know, it, it, it was really hard to organize all these meetings. So it was getting really annoying. And then what she did was this chair, well, she sent me a message from Meg Hillier, um, forward it to me. She said, um, this is a message from Meg. There are other people who could observe so this is a spurious argument. So that's my argument that there were no people free to observe. Um, Meg's message continued, as local chair, you can push back. Lots of members just won't attend. Now, apparently I found out this was one of many messages from Meg and this chair was just not um, smart enough to realize that she was really putting, yeah, giving, putting Meg in trouble by sending this to me because I would have to report it to London Region because it's a breach of the rules. Um, I don't think she realises it's a breach of the rules. I think she thought, oh, it's Meg's trigger ballot. So we should, Meg's important, she's the MP, we should involve her. Um, which I think a lot of people think that. They don't think that MPs should be subject to the normal rules. They should be above that. And they get a little bit flattered when their, their MP is asking something from them, I suppose. So maybe there was a little bit of that going on there. Um, and I think Meg had just organised through her campaign very efficiently and organised what she thought was going to be a Thursday meeting and got guarantees from people to turn up and then was in trouble because suddenly the meeting was ha going to have to be on a different day and didn't want that. And so I was putting pressure on this chair to, and giving this chair arguments to feed to me, to try to convince me. And, and all I did was say, I'm going to have to report this to London Region. Um, if Meg wants, has any other issues, she should be talking to me. I'm in charge of the process. I can take the heat for it. That's, that's my role. You don't have to take heat for it from her. Um, and of course I never heard from Meg. So yeah, these people, they just think they are above the rules. They just lie. They deceive. That is how they work. They don't see anything wrong with it. Sometimes I think, I don't know whether people like Meg know truth from lies anymore. At that stage of your career in politics it's really depressing okay the last thing that i want to come on to which is really important aspect of this is that it's being used to um do a kind of technocratic coup of hackney north labor party so there are two labor parties in hackney um one for the hackney south and shoreditch constituency one for the hackney north and stoke newington constituency and the Hackney North one has not just a left leadership, which is getting increasingly rare in the Labour Party, but a left MP that is even more rare. And the left MP who is in the eye of the storm at the moment, Diane Abbott, um, if people want to know that my views on, on what's being done to Diane Abbott on the witch hunting of her, then again, I'll put a link to a video I made about that um, in the description below. It's really important when we see people like Diane who have been solidly on the left for decades, who have been MPs and taken a lot of crap for their politics and also a lot of racism and sexism in Diane's case. Um, when we see them being shunted out of politics, when we see them being smeared, it's important we stand up for them. And Hackney North was certainly trying to stand up for Diane. And I'm just going to read to you from their statement. And again, I'll put a link to their statements below as well. So after the executive committee members raised safeguarding issues at the exec committee's meeting on the 13th of July, 2023, we were silenced by London Regional Director, Pierlene Sanger, who suddenly joined the Zoom call. Within 24 hours, she moved to pause access to organize the email ne network, which facilitates communication with members. This move was a form of collective punishment for the local party for raising entirely legitimate concerns. Yeah, so they were trying to raise concerns, they were shut down. This shutting down has happened at every level. Um, so there was a shutting down of debate in local parties, north and south. There was a shutting down debate when the Greens, who have been exemplary on this, Hackney Greens, 
um, in calling for an independent inquiry, in raising safeguarding issues, in now tabling a vote of no confidence in the mayor. They have really taken and shown leadership. It's really good to have them in on Hackney Council. I hope more people will vote Green to strengthen that block on the local council because we need an opposition. Um, so yeah, shutting down a debate and we can see how Labour staff in this case were and are complicit. So the statement goes on. The London region restored partial access on Thursday the 7th of September, but the three senior Hackney North Labour Party officers, so that's the chair, the secretary and the treasurer, have been ousted and replaced by three unelected individuals, one of whom is not currently a Hackney North member. This purports to be under the Labour Party guidance for boundary changes. However, this covers constituencies with a change of more than 15% in membership, which does not apply to Hackney North. This is blatant factionalism and outrageous. It is especially damaging at a time when we're working with grassroots members and Hackney residents and community organisations to reassure, them, to reassure them that we take safeguarding with the utmost seriousness. Many CLPs, that's constituency Labour parties around the country, recognise this total disregard of Labour Party rules and democratic processes, both regionally and nationally. Yeah, this is completely against the rules. There's no reason this party has not been suspended. There's no reason why the exec should not continue to operate. Um, you don't need an interim committee, even if there were one needed, which there isn't. You wouldn't need it until after Labour Party conference. So shutting down now, blocking the AGMs. This is all a device that the Labour Party use to, um, to allow the right to organise to take over CLPs um, undemocratically. This was clear. Um, if you haven't seen Labour Files, it's an Al Jazeera series about the ins inner workings of the Labour Party. Um, one of the things that's revealed there is that right-wing Labour Party staff members will take actions to enable local um, right-wing members to organise. In fact, one of them exasperatedly says there's no point in us keeping Warrington CLP suspended because they're not doing anything to organise there, so there's no point in carrying on because we've revealed to the, the truth about, about the use of Labour Party processes to shore up the right, to give them space to organise against the left. OK, so this is what's happening here. Um, these things aren't about the rules, but there will often be use of the rules, as in this case. Oh, you know, it's because of the boundary changes. They kind of provide a, what's the word, a cover for other stuff that if you don't know the rules, you don't look into it, then you wouldn't find out. You would just say, oh, they're just following the rules. There's also an opportunism here. Clearly, the situation with Diane Abbott, with her having been reselected as a local MP unanimously in the trigger ballots, but then having been suspended um, and with an open investigation against her, there will be a need to resolve that investigation, but there's a desire not to do so, there's a desire to make it easy to remove her. And so there's a taking advantage of an opportunity to impose a right-wing leadership to make it easier to get rid of Diane. And it's just horrific that something where the Labour Party staff and Labour Party locally on the right have been so appalling in the way they've acted where it's only been the left who've been questioning and holding them to account, that that is used as cover to impose more power and give more power to that faction that did the damage originally. And this is what happens over and over again in this corrupt party. Okay, just to say who these dodgy right-wingers are who've been given power in Hackney North. Um, Sophie Cameron is chair Lenny Shawcross, Secretary, Dan Bauer, Treasurer. I only know stuff about Sophie Cameron. Um, Sophie Cameron trolled me on Twitter for years. Um, actually, we did the podcast, or I did the podcast with um, uh, Daniel Taylor and Claudia Berlin on Daniel's channel, Complaints on a Plate, which I'll put a link to in the description below, where we talked about trolling. And one of the examples we used actually was Sophie Cameron. I thought at the time, 
there's no reason to name her. Why, why should I be bitter? We'll just talk about it. But actually, I think I should name her now. And I wish I could put evidence of her trolling, but I can't get access to those tweets anymore because she's locked her account. Um, which is, again, something the Labour right do over and over and over again. Um, to hide their crimes, to avoid accountability, and because they think they're better than us. And really, they're not better than us. They're worse than us. I talk to loads and loads of people in Hackney just because I live here and, and also because I campaign here because I've spent hundreds of hours on the streets talking to people and knocking on doors and handing out leaflets and collecting signatures on petitions and all sorts. And most people in Hackney are amazing and it's a shame that we have the people we have representing us. And I really hope that we find a way to demand better, to organise for better, to vote for better and to get better councillors who can you know, do for Hackney what Hackney deserves, which is, Hackney is an amazing place. And, yeah. And I hope that everywhere else that this is happening, maybe not making national news, but I know that low parties all over the country are facing things like this. And we need to expose them and we need to make the connections. And I think one of the things that's just valuable about having the attention of the national media is, and the local media as well, is that it gives us a chance to, um, to make connections to other things that have ha happened, to other things people have done, to show the patterns and the way this corrupt party that is the Labour Party operates, um, and to think what we do next, and hopefully it isn't elect Mete Coban or one of the other um, right-wingers locally as our mayor. Thank you for watching. Um, for those of you who watch regularly, super grateful. I know I said I was going to do two videos a month and I have failed disastrously to do that recently. Uh, it's because I got offered extra work, I'm freelance. Sometimes it's a good idea to take extra work when it arrives. Usually it is, particularly this has been really good fun, um, work writing about science and equality and education and working with someone really nice um, at, at UCL. And so um, I did that and I didn't have time for videos but hopefully I will in the future and um, I hope you're enjoying the sunny weather wherever you are it's super hot here and I've had the windows shut in hope that they'll improve the sound quality on this video so I'm now going to turn this off and open the windows 